It's an epidemic we can do something about. I mean, a child who has a parent in prison shouldn't have an extremely high chance of going to prison themselves. This sets up a cycle of incarceration that lasts for generations. It destroys lives and costs taxpayers millions of dollars each year, and we aim to put a stop to it by healing the relationship with these kids' parents and guiding them to college. Proverbs 226 is trying to reunite fathers with their children. Proverbs 226 begins with the healing process. I will get an opportunity to say to my daughter, Kayla, I'm seeking your forgiveness. Because we're not allowed to really like hug them or touch them or anything. And people just don't realize what it's like not being able to just hug your dad. dad. Alex 2 to 6 happens to be in this picture that God is painting. We happen to be in this picture because we obeyed what God called us to do. Tonight, as you guys are ready to go to school. When I saw how they interacted with their children, with their caregivers, only God can do that. Greetings, my beautiful IP Resilience family and friends. And this in front of you, it's Ilona. And I wish you all the best. If you have your dreams, please go after them. If you have somebody in your life that you haven't said, I love you or hug them, please take a time to do so. In front of me, I have a special guest who is going to completely revolutionize today's topic. And I have in front of me, Mr. Cyril. He is a pastor and he is a founder of Proverbs 22, 6 Ministries. Hi, Mr. Cyril. How are you today? Wonderful, Ilona. It is really nice to be with you this afternoon on the show with you on the resilience. I really like the, uh, you know, the heading of your, uh, you know, the mission that you have on the podcast. So tell us more about Proverbs 22, 6. What does it mean? Why it stands for? And what do you do? Because I want everybody to know exactly what you told me. Fantastic. Uh, so Proverbs 2 to 6, it's actually what Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. The core of like what we are trying to do is to help the children that has a father or mother in prison. Uh, and the thing is this, that uh, Ilona, that uh, a lot of people don't know that if you are a child, if you're a child of an inmate, right, your probability of going into prison is close to 70 to 80%, right? And so because of which what happens is like over the years, these children have been following the footsteps of their fathers, right? And that every single day, Ilona, even today, when you go put your head on the pillow, right? Know this today, we have sent the 4,500 kids that went to a prison, jail, or some correctional system today, right? And so the, the verse says, train up a child in the way he should go, not in the way his father went, not in the way his mother went, right? So we wanted to intersect in the life of these children and help them to break the cycle that's feeding into the system on an ongoing basis. Every single day, this is a struggle, Ilona. So Proverbs 2 to 6 is, uh, you know, um, is, is an operation that we want to mend the relationship and help these kids, uh, you know, get out of the cyclical cycle. You know, every person, when they do something significant in their life, they also have a reason. So why is that important for you to do what you're doing right now? Because I'm sure there's a very fundamental story that will probably bring us to tears. Oh, absolutely, Lona. There is uh, um, three things that, uh, you know, led me to this path. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, uh, even today, the divorce rate in India is less than 1%, right? Uh, it's anywhere between 1% to 2% in India. But for some reason, you know, in 1970s, uh, early part of 1970s, uh, you know, I was a part of that 1% where my mom was abandoned uh, with a six-month-old baby. Right. And she wasn't educated. She didn't have like, a, you know, a lot of resources, but somehow she relied on God to just like open the doors for her. Uh, and in fact, like, uh, you know, she would go serve in different houses, not expect. 
expect that grace, that grace that she's showing on them will find me. Here's what happened, Ilona. That grace went all the way to Australia, Wales, Australia. There was a family named Annie and Graham. They took a $30, $35 cent money all the way to India so I can actually go to school, right? So this effort that I'm doing in, in Proverbs 2 to 6 is just like a showing the same rope somebody has given to me when I was a kid. This is like my payback time for what I received, right? The second thing, Elona, is this, that uh, when I came into this country in 1993, I was going to buy a computer, right? This is like a, any um, Indian kid that shows up in America, we have to have a computer. Otherwise we get like really nervous, right? And uh, what happened was that, that morning when I called the computer store, he said, it's $14.75. So I took a $15, $100 bill to that store. And when I landed there, the guy said, like, who brings, you know, $100 bills to buy a computer? I said, sure, no problem. Why don't you hold on to my $1,400? Let me go get the change uh, for the $100, right? So I was on the streets of San Leandro, California, walking around asking people, do you have change? Do you have a change? You know? And uh, the thing is that people were like running away from me saying like, oh, why is this Asian guy running around with a hundred dollar bill and where did he get the hundred dollar bill, right? But after 30, 35 minutes, I went back up. But this time I didn't see the guy who took my $1,400. There were three or four other guys standing in the crowd and they said, come on in. So when I walked in, they closed the shutters and uh, they pulled the gun, click, click, click. And they're all saying like, a face down, face down. My, my first reaction is that, you know, in my mind, it's not even striking that the guns can shoot, right? So in my mind, there's only two guys who can shoot. Um, you know, Clint Eastwood in the streets of San Francisco and Rambo in the forest, right? So I pushed their gun and I'm looking for my $1,400. But they thought like I was like a macho guy not respecting their guns. So they pushed me on the floor, tied my hands to the back, plastered my mouth. And uh, when they took me into the dark room, I saw the sales guy tied up just like me. Mm -hmm. And so it was just like a bad time to be at the bad place, right? And so this whole experience, like a nearly 45 minutes, Elena, we were on the floor. We have no idea whether we're going to survive that moment or not. It was just like a, the most longest 45 minutes that I had in my life. And so what happened is right after that, you know, when the whole thing was over, you know, I, um, by the way, you know, when the, when the cops came and the, the newspaper guys and everybody was asking questions, right? So I was happily answered, just like how I'm answering you right now. By the way, my 1400 was on my sales guy's pocket. So I got my money back. So I didn't lose. It was like, a, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, a reality show, right? So the next day morning when I was going to work, I saw this big article that says in the Oakland Tribune, high-tech robbery in San Leandro. So I was thinking to myself, what is this? So I'm opening up and I'm looking at it and it says everything correctly. Halfway through it says, Cyril Prabhu, that's me, right? Cyril Prabhu, who lives in Union City, said he can identify these people. And it was like almost like in the front page uh, of that newspaper, right? So at this point, I was like an ET, go home, right? <laughs> so I just went, uh, you know, looking for tickets to go back to India. But somehow God used that situation to look at those men that put me through those experience and look at like, uh, you know, their families, look at the prison system, um, and, and so this was the second break in my life towards this direction. But the third one is that my day job is data mining, right? So I mine data for, um, you know, big corporations like a Bank of America. So I started to mine about the prison system in this country. And I found out that initially I thought this was an African-American problem. Why? I do see a lot of African-Americans in prison. Right? I do see a lot of stats that are stacked up against them. One out of three African-American men are in prison in large cities. 
any African-American child that does not complete high school has a huge probability of going to prison or die. All these stats were stacked against them. So I thought this was an African-American issue, right? Then I see Latinos, Hispanics, a large number of Hispanics, nationally eight out of 10 Latino moms that are giving birth or Hispanic moms that are giving birth are single moms. So the commonality is not someone being like a, 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 a black or a white or a brown or a Hispanic or African American, doesn't matter. What is common between all of this thread is that the father is not being at home. So that's what inspired me to go after this problem because 70 to 80% of men that are serving time in prison today grew up without fathers. And their children have 82% probability of going to prison themselves. So Proverbs 2 to 6's mission is to break that cycle, stop that pipeline from feeding into system. This is very powerful. And I hope people stay to the end to hear more about you and find you and get to know more about your mission and vision of what you do. And you know, you have also relationship with the senators and tell us more about how he found about you and what he says about you and how you impact not just the, your community, but how your vision is going to impact this country. Oh, absolutely, Ilona. The thing is this, um, the first thing that we wanted to do, um, there are two problems that we are trying to address in Proverbs 36. Number one, we want to address the, the fatherlessness because that's a huge contributor uh, to, to the prison population growing right now. The second thing is lack of education. Um, you know, the, the, the country today, Ilona, has like, a, you know, one out of eight kids that goes to elementary school doesn't complete high school. And uh, the dropout rate of uh, kids coming out of school every single year is about 6.6 .6 million children, right? And so what we wanted to do is like a hub these kids, you know, to mend the relationship. There are three things that we do in that. We take these children into the prison, and this is how the fathers sign up these kids into the program. The fathers have to get on their knees and ask for forgiveness by washing their feet. There is a tangible difference that it does to the child, it does to the father as well, right? So this is how they start. But then throughout the year, we have events that are going on inside the prison. During the summertime, we turn the prison into a Walmart. We allow, we take like a forty to $50,000 worth of school supplies. We turn that place into a bookstore. We allow the kids to pack the school supplies before they go to school, right? And during this winter time, we actually take the daughters inside and allow the fathers to dance with their daughters. Why? One of the biggest drawback for this, this mission of Proverbs 2 to 6 is these young kids getting pregnant at a, at a, at a very young age, right? And so uh, we wanted the fathers to hold their children together and tell their daughters that they will come home. Tell their daughters how precious and beautiful she is. Tell their daughters that you know one day this will all be over. They need to give the assurance to that baby girl because for every girl, the dads are the important part of their life, right? And so when we do that part, those are like a reconciliation events that we do, but we also send these kids to college and pay scholarship for them. So when we started this journey, Ilona, that we had 59 kids that were ready to go to school. And so we were so excited that, you know, they were like in the age group of 15 to 18. And so when we started to make phone calls, this was the first year in 2012, right? We started to make phone calls and we found out that 30 out of the 59 were already in prison. 19 of them were pregnant, could not go to school. And nearly 10 of them were doing a fifth and sixth grade. They were not ready to go to school. So the first year we couldn't find even one kid that could go to school. And, but then the father started to wash their children's feet. The father started to heal the children's heart. Father started to dance with their daughters and telling them 
that they are going to be okay. As we progressed this following year, we were able to send three kids to college. We were like, Yahoo, we got like a three kids in college, right? But from there, uh, Elona, we went to 10 kids, 15, 25. Today, we have 82 children in college. And in the next four years, we have about 2,000 kids that are getting ready to go to college or higher education or some technical school. And so we are excited like that, right? So when this news actually reached the Washington DC, what happened was like, you know, Senator Tim Scott and his chief of staff had a chance to view some of these videos, some of these contents. And so the, the Senator asked me like, how can he be part of this mission? So I told him, come on over and serve inside the prison. It is much better for me to, to, to just like, uh, you know, take you into the prison and show you really what happens in there compared to like, a, you know, telling us like a story. And so two weeks later, he and uh, Jennifer D. Casper, his chief of staff and the entourage of people came to two prisons and uh, senators served whole day inside the prison, uh, talking to these men, talking to these uh, children, talking to these mothers, uh, because Senator Tim Scott has a you know, huge heart for this mission. So then he had a chance to testify on a criminal justice reform in DC. That's when he talked his experience out there. What you do is just absolutely influential and it's so impactful to our country. So uh, as you were sharing your story, the image that stuck into my head is fathers washing the feet of their children. And it's, I don't know if anybody will become any like a heartless people after watching that. I think this uh, segment and this moment alone has to do some kind of breakthrough. So tell us a little bit about that, what this experience to every single girl, every single child, and even for the father means, is there any change after that? I'm sure there is some kind of change. And what does it mean to them? Right. So there, so you, there are like a three questions that you actually packed in that one question. So let me answer them. First with the fathers, right? I've heard from the prison system right after this even happens, uh, the prison goes through a mode of like a calmness. Uh, these fathers are, uh, you know, just like when they go back into their dorms, they're talking about it. And uh, a couple of years ago, like uh, there was a major uh, effect that, uh, um, you know, there was a riot in one of the prisons in South Carolina, Lee Correctional, right? And the thing is that in, in that night, between like a nine o'clock to three o'clock in the morning, nearly 17 guys were killed uh, in that riot, right? Very young guys were uh, killed during that riot. But when you view them from the top of the prison, there is a corridor on the east side and there is a corridor on the west side and the administrative buildings are in the middle, right? Only one side of the prison was you know, reacting and rioting and doing all these things while the other side of the prison was very calm, quiet, and nobody got involved in the riot, even though they knew that was going on the other side. The only commonality that they could find was the fathers of Proverbs 2 to 6 that were staying on the west wing of those corridors that kept not only, uh, you know, from getting into trouble, but also they stop the others to get into trouble. Why? Because these fathers have to be one year traction free before they can be part of it. If they get into trouble like a riot, then they cannot participate in this program. So that's the kind of an impact that the fathers face inside the prison. Now come to the children, right? The children that you know are part of this now we, we did a study before the fathers wash the children's feet and after what we are finding, their grades are improving. Their behavior problems in schools are coming down. And these kids are now getting ready to go to college and higher education. This is a change in paradigm. The, the, the kids often say they were in a dark place. But can you imagine, Elena, if someone washes your feet and tells you, 
I'm really sorry. I'm humbling myself to the point of like a washing your feet. Uh, they are serious about fixing this problem, right? And so the kids are doing well. That's how now we have more kids that are getting ready to go to school. All of our kids that are part of this program are double or triple majors. And they're, uh, you know, the GPA is like a 4.6 to 5.8. These kids are doing uh, studies on biometrical engineering, computer science, or secondary education. So these kids are doing two or three majors in their, in their profession, nursing and so on. Now, also the third part of this thing is that in South Carolina, when we started this journey, it was a number one state in the country, number one employer of South Carolina Department of Correction was the number one employer, right? In 2012, 10 years ago, the Department of Correction was the number one employer, right? Of state of South Carolina. Today, 10 years passed by that the state of South Carolina is the number one state in the country for the lowest recidivism, which is a term used for fathers coming back into prison after being released. So here we are less than 20% in the state of South Carolina, the fathers that are coming back compared to a national 70% is the average nationally, right? The number of inmates has come down from 26,000 inmates to 15,000 inmates in South Carolina. And in the women's prison, it's a 0%. If a, if a mom, that washed her children's feet, her chance of coming back into prison is 0% compared to the men's prison, it's about 1.8%. That's the impact, um, you know, the state of South Carolina is seeing, Elena, right now. Our well, numbers tell the story and what you do is impacts our heart too. So you speak to, the, to everybody right now. And I want you to take a moment and speak to the father right now, the father who is in the prison right now, I want you to take this time and speak to him. Oh, absolutely. The fathers that, uh, you know, that are watching this, uh, that it's still not over. And uh, the thing is, uh, these children of yours uh, think that you are the best dad in the whole wide world. All they want is this. They want an answer from you for a very, very important question. Did you ever love me? They just want you to answer that question for them. If only we can answer that question, the crime in this nation will come down. Dads, be cheered up. This is not the end. We still have an opportunity to go into the lives of these, your children, and you can put a medicine in their hearts that we cannot see through our naked eyes. It was so powerful and it touched even my heart for that. And yes, the question that we need to ask, do you ever love me? And love, you know, is everything. It's such a force, such a power that can do miracles in our hearts and especially in our country as well. We all need love. And you guys, thank you so much for staying with us until the end and watching this amazing heartfelt segment. Please reach out to our guest, contact him, connect with me, and let's make a difference together because together we are stronger. Thank you so much, Mr. Cyril. Thank you so much for what you do. <laughs>